those of you who have just joined, um, I, I just said this a minute ago, but just so you're all aware who've just turned up, uh, we do record this. We don't email it out because there's some legal ramifications for us doing so because technically we don't have, we're not, uh, you know, uh, unless you're a member of Second Nature, we're not allowed to email you even if you signed up and, and, and things like that. It's, it's all a bit confusing how it works. We need to get permission to send it out to you basically, uh, which is all a bit, uh, all a bit difficult to do. But we put it up on our YouTube channel. So if you have a YouTube account, you can subscribe to Second Nature and uh, you'll see the, the, the recording get uploaded. We also share it on our Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and uh, what else do we have? Facebook, <laughs> all of our social media accounts, this will be shared. So just, um, and if you're a member of Second Nature, we will share it in the communities as well. So yeah, you'll have, um, you'll have access to this recording when you need it. In terms of emailing this out in the future, I promise it is something we will figure out it's just something I need to figure out via Zoom and the legal stuff. It's just, you know, GDPR these days, you're going to be too careful. Anyway, I think we should uh, get going. And uh, Tom, I think we should do some introductions quick. So would Why you not? like to uh, introduce yourself to everyone and uh, give a brief overview of your interest in this topic? Yeah. Um, so hello, everyone. I am Tom. I'm a senior health coach here at Second Nature and a registered nutritionist. I've been with the company for the last four years um, and I, I love it. And I love helping people um, make the, the uh, achieve the goals they want to achieve on the program. Um, my interest is uh, in this in this area around semaglutides and these medications is that actually um, a lot of people try to lose weight. And sometimes it doesn't quite work for them. And with the latest research, as we're going to go through, that sometimes this could, could is the big word here, be the, the step that people might need to help them achieve their goals. And so um, from a nutrition point of view, um, and this is why I'm so interested in it, is that actually, yeah, we can do a lot with, with our lifestyle change, but some people need that extra little thing to just help them get on their way. So that's me. What about you, Robbie? Amazing. Thanks, Tom. So I didn't mean to do that. Um, thank you so much. I completely agree. And we'll be, we'll be talking all through that. And also, uh, for those of you who don't know, Tom is actually also um, taking GLP-1 medications at the moment, and we'll be sharing some of his anecdotal experience at the end. Um, it's important to say before that, as Tom would say, individual experiences are always going to vary, but Tom will just give a bit of an insight into what it's like on GLP-1s. Um, and it will complement the science we'll be going through as well. So please stick around for that at the end if you're interested. Um, there's also, we'll share this at the end, but there's also a lot of online forums on Reddit and other places. There will be within our communities as well where um, people are sharing their stories and it's all very interesting too. So my name's Robbie Puddick. I'm, I'm one of the registered nutritionists here at Second Nature. I'm now on the content team. So I used to be a health coach and now I uh, sort of write uh, the, and develop some of the content for the program. And uh, yeah, my interest in this area is obviously based on the fact that I'm developing the content and researching a lot of the science around GLP-1s. And uh, it's, it's such an interesting area. I've, I, I'd say up until about six months ago, I never considered um, it necessary to take medications for weight loss. I, I was always very much, um, you know, I always promoted a natural approach and always believed you know, you know, we should lose weight naturally. And that was the only way that people would really like achieve it in the long term. But then about six months ago, Mike, our co-founder, asked me to do some research and write a blog on, on, on GLP-1 medication specifically. So the first time I looked at it and I was actually just extremely surprised by what I, what I, what I found. And obviously we'll be presenting today what we found. So um, afraid I have to leave at seven to make the cinema. No worries, Tom. <laughs> You go to the cinema, we will finish at seven. So uh, some of the um, just um, uh, some of the things I should run through quickly, like I said before, this will be recorded, we'll share it later. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to share, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, in terms of questions, just to make sure we don't lose the questions within the chat, because sometimes it can get a bit busy, please use the Q&A button. If you're on your phone, you might have to press the, the, the three dots that goes to more and find the Q&A. Uh, that's where we'll, we'll prioritise the questions. So specific questions, someone's already put in a very good uh, question. We'll talk about that later. Um, and what we'll do is I think, Tom, if you're happy to, if there's really simple questions or ones we're not able to answer, Tom can answer live and um, 
and just uh, type them up for you. Or if they're really great questions that we want to cover later on in the Q&A, we'll hold fire and we'll answer them live. And as well, just to let you all know, we can't see or hear any of you. And um, so like make as much noise as, if you like, as, as you like, if you've got dogs, kids running about, if you're making dinner, it's all good, we can't hear you. Okay, so, right, let's get to it. So today, what we'll cover. Um, we will be covering a short history of the hormone GLP-1 and GLP-1 medications. We'll be looking specifically at semaglutide and GLP-1s. So you might've heard a few pronunciations of semaglutide. I've heard a few Americans say sem semaglutide, but I, I, I watched a YouTube video on pronunciation that said semaglutide. So yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, we'll be looking at side effects and safety of the medications. And then a bit more of a philosophical question, uh, as much as a scientific one around them being, you know, are they a magic pill? Are they the wonder drug, the cure for obesity that some uh, headlines are making them out to be? And uh, yeah, and then we'll have a very brief over overview of the Second Nature uh, GLP-1 program that we'll be releasing this year or in, in the coming months. So let's make a start on the first section. So short history of the hormone GLP-1. So in 1987, researchers discovered a gut-derived, so it just means um, a hormone uh, that was is made and released in the gut, a uh, hormone that increased insulin release. So insulin is the hormone that uh, lowers our blood sugar and it lowered blood sugar levels and seemed to lower our appetite. So it's actually only been discovered in the last, what, you know, 30, 33 years, 35, six, like, what year are we in? 36 years or so since we discovered the hormone GLP-1. And the name GLP-1 comes from the fact that it was very similar to another hormone that's released from the liver called glucagon. And uh, not in their function, but just in their, the way they look, their chemical structure. So if, they were, if you looked at the two hormones in the microscope, you might mistake one of them for one another because they looked identical. So the name was glucagon-like peptide 1. Peptide is just... Um, a string of proteins, essentially, because all hormones are made out of uh, different forms of amino acids. So shortened, much easier, GLP-1. So it's just because it looks like another hormone called glucagon, but the functions are very different. So it's not glucagon-like in function, it's just in how it looks visually. So how does GLP-1 work? And obviously, at the moment, we're still talking about the hormone, not the medication. So here's a, here's a quick breakdown. So after you eat a meal, and the food goes, uh, goes through your stomach or into, into your gut, GLP-1 is released from your gut into the bloodstream. Um, so easy enough, e easy enough process there. There's often, uh, there's a lot of other hormones going on as well, by the way, so there's all these other hunger hormones, but we'll just focus on GLP-1. So you eat a meal and uh, your gut senses all the nutrients coming in and it releases GLP-1 into the bloodstream. So what GLP-1 does through the bloodstream is it travels to target organs. So there's all of these receptors around the body that are attached to the gut, the brain, the pancreas, the liver, even your adipose tissue as well, your fat cells. So there's all of these organs and systems in the body, even your central nervous system, which is very interesting, which have receptors, which act a bit like a door. So they cling to the hormone GLP-1 and and then GLP-1 can kind of do its, do its action. So once it binds to the receptors on these target organs, that's when it starts to have an effect on their function and influences our physiology. So let's break these down a little bit. So in the brain, this is probably the most important mechanism for lowering appetite that's associated with GLP-1. So it communicates directly with the hypothalamus, which is an area of the brain. It's like our appetite control center. Um, and what it does is it lowers our food seeking behaviors. So research has shown that people which are exposed to high levels of GLP-1, they're less likely to find um, food more highly rewarding. They have less desire to seek out food. And overall, their hunger levels are just much lower. They're less interested in eating in that particular moment if their GLP-1 levels are high. So, and then next organ in the pancreas. So the pancreas is the hormone, which uh, the hormone, the pancreas is the organ which um, makes and releases insulin, particularly the beta cells within the pancreas. So GLP-1 within the pancreas instructs the beta cells to release more insulin 
and manage the levels of glucose in the bloodstream. So this helps to lower blood glucose levels after a meal. And it also, interestingly, because of the name glucagon-like, it actually prevents glucagon release because glucagon has very different functions. Where um, GLP-1 instructs the beta cells to release more insulin to help lower blood sugar levels, when glucagon levels are high, they're actually telling the liver to release more sugar into the bloodstream to try and increase blood sugar levels. So you can imagine, you know, obviously glucagon like peptide one, it's not in function, just in, in name. So, and then in digestion uh, with the gut, it slows down the movement of food from the stomach to the small intestine. So this is known as gastric emptying. So it slows down the release of food uh, from the stomach. And it also influences the contractions in your colon, in your gut, again, slowing down the rate that food travels through your GI tract. And you might be thinking, well, why is that important? Well, um, one of the things that influences our hunger levels is the rate of digestion. So some foods like refined carbohydrates and ultra processed foods and sugar, for example, one of the reasons they aren't very satisfying and they're not very filling is because they are digested so quickly and the body doesn't have time to you know, pick up the signals of, of the amount of nutrients that are there. And it doesn't have time to signal to the brain, hey, this is how many calories are here. This is how much protein is there. It kind of bypasses our mechanisms for understanding how much energy is there. And it's one of the reasons why, say, a few hours after having a takeaway or a McDonald's, you might actually still, you might actually feel a little bit pe peckish. It's because ultra processed foods travel much quicker through our uh, Digest, uh, digestion. Okay, so all of this is to say the mechanisms in the brain and even with your blood sugar and in the gut, it leaves you feeling fuller for longer and less likely to overeat. So that's GLP-1, the hormone. But interestingly, its effects are quite short-lived. So it's not a hormone that's circulating at high levels throughout our body all across the day. GLP-1 is actually rapidly removed from the system by an enzyme called DPP-4, which you can think of like Pac-Man. It basically breaks down the hormone GLP-1 very quickly so that after just two minutes, more than 50% of the hormone that is originally released from the guts has been broken down, degraded, and essentially removed from circulation. So you might be thinking, um, a question to always ask when you're told new information about the body is to think, I, I got taught this at university, I had an amazing lecturer at Westminster, and she always said, you know, ask why. So if you learn a new mechanism, really interesting, we've got this really what sounds like an amazing hormone, it helps us to manage our blood sugar levels, it keeps hunger low, prevents us from seeking out too much food, that sounds great. So why would the body have a Pac-Man-like enzyme which breaks it down really quickly, so its effects are really short-lived? And we're only really speculating here, um, but it's, it's quite interesting, um, possibly as to why. Well, if you think back in our evolution, um, obviously we needed to seek out food. And as we were hunter gatherers, uh, when we were maybe even subsistence farmers, you know, way back when, um, if, we weren't, if we didn't have that drive to seek out food, we might not survive very long in the wild. We kind of constantly needed that little nag of hunger and desire to go and find food because that was important for our survival, it's important for our reproduction, and it's one of the reasons we're still here today. So if the body just allowed GLP-1 to stay high all the time, you might not have that desire to seek out food and survive. And there might also be um, issues with long-term exposure. It might be that it, you know, chronic exposure to GLP-1 has uh, adverse effects and the body only wants to use it in, in these acute phases. So there's a few reasons there what, um, where, why it might be. And to be honest, sometimes the body just does things and there's no explanation as to why. So uh, yeah. Okay. So in sum, you've got step one, GLP-1 is released from the gut. <coughs> Excuse me, after eating. Step two, GLP-1 binds to receptors in the pancreas, the brain, the gut and other, other systems around the body um, to you know, do all the things we said. And then step three, it's actually rapidly removed from the system by the Pac-Man enzyme DPP-4. So it only has a short-term effect of lowering blood sugar levels and our appetite. It's kind of like an acute phase uh, release. So it's only short-term. 
Okay, so this is where GLP-1 medications come in. It kind of got scientists excited when they discovered GLP-1. If they could create a mimetic or, you know, just a mimic, um, an analog you might have heard as well being used of GLP-1 that was resistant to Pac-Man, DPP-4, it could be a game changer for, you know, rising obesity, rising levels of type 2 diabetes, not just in the West, now in developing countries also. Um, so globally, obesity is on the rise. There's many things we're getting better at and improving. Heart disease deaths are going down, etc. But there's a lot of things that we're, we're still not uh, managing to control, and that is obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, <laughs> Amanda, sorry, the, ma the, the mouse on my screen. Yeah, apologies. If anyone's trying to flick away a fly, it's just my mouse. Um, and that's exactly what they've done, essentially. So this is how GLP-1 medications work. You've got the GLP-1 medication, which is broken down by DPP-4 uh, Pac-Man very quickly. Most of it is gone within 20 minutes or so. But what happens is GLP-1 receptor agonists, as they're known, GLP-1s, GLP-1 medications, semaglutide, et cetera, they mimic GPP, uh, GLP-1, but they're resistant to Pac-Man. So they can last much longer in the system and they bind, they do exactly the same thing. They bind to those receptors in the, in the organs, the pancreas, the brain, the gut, and they have a longer lasting, a prolonged effect to lower blood glucose levels and support weight loss. Because if you can imagine, your brain is essentially constantly being told because they can last up to a week, these longer lasting medications, um, to lower food seeking behaviors. So if at the moment you've got a very high, um, uh, you know, um, desire to go out and seek food constantly, you're always hungry, you always think about food, preoccupied, by, preoccupied uh, by food. These medications are toning that down in the brain. And yeah, this is exactly what they did. So we're talking about semaglutide today, but semaglutide is just the latest in a long line of GLP-1 medications. It was in 2005 that the first one, Exanatide uh, BID, uh, became the first GLP-1 receptor agonist um, to hit the market. Uh, and it was actually made from a hormone found on lizard tongues, which is really interesting. Um, so, uh, and I don't know too much more about the chemistry behind that, but I just think that's a very uh, interesting story. That, <laughs> that monster is much bigger than the fly. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, and um, in terms of a timeline, um, in 2017, the first semaglutide uh, branded as Ozempic was approved in the US, I think maybe 2018 in the UK. Oh no, sorry. Um, yeah, maybe 2018. And in 2021, um, Saxenda, liraglutide, another GLP-1 medication approved in the UK. And in 2022, semaglutide uh, was approved in the UK and Wigovi, which is the larger, the, the basically semaglutide, but in a bigger, in a bigger, in bigger volume was approved for use in the UK as well. So there's a lot going on. You might have also heard um, in the news something called Tazepatide, which is branded as Manjaro, which is approved in the US, not in the UK. That's also um, in the process of being approved in the UK as well. And that's a talk for another day. So yeah, so there's more than 10 types of GLP-1s available. Um, semaglutide Wigovi being the most effective to date. Um, we'll be looking at the data as to why. But yeah, you've got exenatide, liraglutide, duloglutide, um, semaglutide now. Um, most of them longer lasting now. Um, the, sh the shorter term, shorter lasting ones weren't as effective. Okay. And right, so let's look at a bit of the science behind semaglutide specifically. So what is all of the fuss about essentially? So let's look at some of the data. So with semaglutide uh, compared to placebo, we typically see 15 to 20% of weight loss after 12 months. So this is using the Wegovi, semaglutide 2.4. You might be wondering what's the difference between, difference between Wegovi and Ozempic. Ozempic semaglutide only goes up to one milligram. So that was originally um, uh, approved for use with type 2 diabetes, but then since then they conducted more randomized controlled trials, including this one, looking at a higher dose to see um, if it was effective and if it was tolerable. And yes, you can see um, that, yeah, it's compared to placebo, very effective. So what they did in this trial is both, and this was in a trial with 
uh, I think way over um, 2000 people, uh, very, I think maybe 1800, 1900 people. So a very large um, uh, trial. Both groups were on uh, a lifestyle intervention. So a standard lifestyle intervention that they would conduct where you get access to a dietitian, you'd have weekly group sessions, it was all in person, that kind of thing. And you'd receive information on the healthy diet and exercise. One group received the semaglutide injection the other group received a placebo, which was just a saline solution. And this is a double blind trial, which meant neither the researchers or the participants knew what they were getting. And yes, if anyone's seen our famous results from the NDPP, where we were, in terms of weight loss, we were twice as effective as our competitors in the NHS. Um, they were, that was only 7%. So we, we're the most effective weight loss company or program in the UK as determined by the BMJ and the NHS. Uh, but that was only around seven to eight percent weight loss on average, compare this to semaglutide uh, around 50% after 12 months. So yes, very substantial. And there's been indirect analysis where they look at data from different trials where they don't uh, compare directly. And as you can see here in the orange, semaglutide has been shown to be almost twice as effective at reducing weight loss than other GLP-1 medications. Um, that um, so liraglutide, exanacide, diloglutide, um, and it is the most effective to date. And um, a recent RCT, so randomized controlled trial, confirmed as well. They compared directly semaglutide 2.4 to liraglutide, which is a daily uh, injection, uh, GLP-1 medication. And yes, semaglutide was almost twice as effective as liraglutide, or, or branded as Saxenda. Uh, you might have heard. It's also not surprisingly considering the association between blood sugar levels and weight loss, but it's also more effective at lowering blood sugar, uh, not twice as effective at lowering blood sugar, um, but much more still substantially more effective than say liraglutide, diloglutide at lowering blood sugar levels. Okay. And interestingly, with type 2 diabetes, obviously remission is, is a very hot topic at the moment. And um, whilst there hasn't been studies looking at remission in terms of the clinical um, reference uh, of, uh, of, of remission, but they looked at 2.4 milligrams of semaglutide to placebo in individuals with two type 2 diabetes. And they showed that nearly 70% of participants achieved an HbA1c, which is a blood sugar level, below 48 or 6.5% for those of you in the US after just over a year. And that is below the diagnostic threshold of type two diabetes. It's technically not remission because the definition of remission includes complete cessation of all medications, which would include semaglutide, metformin, insulin, et cetera. However, this is still extremely promising. It's still showing that nearly two thirds or just over two thirds of participants on this medication effectively put their diabetes into remission as de defined by the blood sugar levels. So really, really interesting. Okay, so a question comes like, why is it so effective? So what is it about semaglutide that makes it more effective than other GLP-1 medications? Um, I don't think we truly know, but I think there's a few reasons. It's longer lasting, so it just stays in circulation longer but also the, due to the chemical structure. So the way they synthesize these medications, it's all, often a, a different chemical uh, bonds of different fatty acids and, and proteins and amino acids to replicate GLP-1. Um, and it just seems that it's much better tolerated. So more people stay on it effectively. The study that we looked at a second ago, which did a direct comparison of semaglutide to liraglutide, showed that less than 10% of people on semaglutide uh, actually stopped taking the medication and dropped out of the trial because of the adverse events and side effects, compared to nearly 30% on liraglutide, sexenda. So, you know, it's, it's like, you know, much more, to it's, people basically tolerate it better, they stay on the medication for longer, and the GLP-1s are able to have that effect in the long term. Okay, cool. Right, so let's move on to side effects and safety, which is a really important topic much with like with any medication it's always important to understand uh, the, the risks the rewards the pros and cons so um they're mainly gi related as you can imagine due to the impact that the medication has on the gut and our digestive system and the stomach 
This can cause some discomfort, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, um, less common, um, but still, still common, five to 10% of people, headaches, tiredness. Some people lose complete interest in food altogether, as in struggling to eat completely, which is not a good thing. Seems to happen in five to 10% of participants really struggle to eat enough. And you might be thinking, you know, why is that a bad thing? We want to lose weight. You know, the less you eat, the more weight you lose. Well, um, to a point, we don't want people to lose so much that they're not providing their body with enough substance to provide enough nutrients for, uh, uh, nutrients for their body to help with the immune system and, and everyday function. We want to provide enough protein so we don't lose muscle mass and lean mass during, during weight loss. And we, all oft, we also want to provide enough energy that we don't signal to the brain that we're in a famine, which would trigger some difficult responses from the brain, which tend to shut down certain body processes. So yeah, we don't want to lose complete interest in food. Um, however, they're typically transient. So they, they normally pass. They typically come during, uh, within two days of the, uh, of the injection, which you take once a week or each day with liraglutide or with semaglutide, you take it once a week. And you normally experience those side effects within 24 to 48 hours, but they typically subside. And then the longer you're on the medication, the longer your body has time to adapt to it. And typically those adverse events and, and side effects calm down. Also in dose escalation. So when you go from say 0.25 to 0.5, up to one, up to 1.7, you typically see an increase in, in symptoms during that time until your body tends to manage them and they do calm down. However, there's very few serious adverse events reported so far. So obviously the data is still, you know, four to five years old. We don't have 10, 15, 20 year data, um, but there's very few serious adverse events. So serious adverse events would be anything leading to, you know, a death or a, a hospitalization or anything that potentially risk is a severe risk of health and life in, in that moment. So there's very few serious adverse events. They're typically mild and uncomfortable side effects. And um, yeah, this graph just, oh, it's a bit complicated. There's a lot going on, but essentially it's just showing how transient um, the side effects are. So nausea tends to peak after about 30 days, but then subsides and goes down. Constipation seems to affect around 10% of participants throughout and stays pretty constant. Um, so it tends to peak, but then come down. Okay, <clears throat> so the bottom line, around 85 to 95%, so the majority, the vast majority of people will experience side effects of the medication at least once. It doesn't mean they'll experience it the whole time, but they will experience at least one side effect whilst they're on the medication, most people. Around 10 to 20% of people will be experienced side effects at any one time. So that means in that randomized controlled trial where there was say a thousand people, you would say one to 200 people at any one moment are experiencing side effects and they might, their side effects might subside and other people experience side effects. So it kind of cycles like that. Um, but changing lifestyle habits can manage these symptoms most of the time. So for example, things like nausea and vomiting, they will often come because people are maybe used to bigger portions and they try to eat similar portions whilst they're on this medication. But because of that slower transit time of the food, that leads to that nausea, that leads to that, that vomiting potentially. So yeah, often eating smaller meals, getting outside, exercising, um, you know, not eating uh, food that's too spicy because that can damage the gut lining, things like that. And, in, and importantly, less than 10% of people will discontinue the medication due to side effects. So. For example, like we said, with Saxenda, liraglutide, it was nearly 30% of people that would come off the medication because it was just too uncomfortable. But with semaglutide, it's less than 10%. So that is a positive thing that it, most people tolerate it. Very few serious adverse events. And um, you might have heard as well that, um, that uh, GLP-1 medications can adversely affect the pancreas and the thyroid. However, um, that's mainly liraglutide and dulaglutide that have shown those associations. At the moment, and this is at the moment, there's no research to show that semaglutide adversely affects the pancreas or the thyroid. There's just no data showing that yet. However, 
Despite that, because of the previous links with dulaglutide and liraglutide, um, the, uh, uh, the agencies, the organizations have said, and medically as well, um, it's not recommended for anyone with a history of pancreatic cancer in the family or pancreatitis or thyroid cancer um, or related disorders to take a GLP-1 medication. It might be in a few years, we have enough data to come through that says, hey, look, there's no association with semaglutide in these conditions, and actually it's, an, it's beneficial, um, and they might change, but at the moment it's not recommended. So yeah, I think uh, the caveat to all this is, in terms of safety in particular, uh, for semaglutide we only have data for up to two years, particularly with this higher dose. Um, we don't know what the long-term effects might be. There are examples of other medications, as everyone's probably aware, where um, the safety profile looks quite good for the first few years, but then there's an increase in, in other things longer term. So yeah, um, that's why we have follow-up data and that's why it's important for anyone who might be on these medications in the future to remain in that constant communication with your pharmacist, nurse, doctor, so they can track anything. Really important. Okay, so we're leaning towards the end. And this is um, probably the most important part of this discussion, uh, personally for me anyway. So are GLP-1 a magic pill? We've, we've talked about their effectiveness, how much they can support weight loss and, and blood sugar levels and diabetes. And it can, be, it can become quite easy to just become a bit hyperbolic and say it's a cure, it's a wonder drug. Oh my God, everyone should be on this. Um, but no, unfortunately, that's not the case. It's not a magic pill. It's not a wonder drug. It's not the cure for obesity. Um, so here's three reasons why that is. The first is individual variability. So we said on average, 15%, um, on average, we see 15, 20% weight loss um, in these trials, which is, which is monumental. It's bigger than any other lifestyle intervention trials you're likely to see. Um, and much, much more effective than any other drug that's ever been trialed. But not everyone achieves that. Some people achieve 25, 30% weight loss. Other people achieve less than 5%. And clinically speaking, um, you have to reach five to 10% of weight loss for that to be, have a significant impact on your health in terms of blood sugar levels and reducing risk of chronic diseases. There's a, a good 10% of people that don't lose any weight, lose less than 5%, lose less than 10%. So yeah, there's great individual variability with these medications. Uh, one thing we've already discussed is lack of long-term data. We don't know what the long-term effects of these medications will be. Like with anything, as time goes on, more data will be collected and more associations or non-associations to other implications uh, medically will come to light. And yeah, so it's important to keep that in mind. And something people might have heard of as well, an important topic, is weight regain. So, Weight regain on semaglutide is quite significant after this trial um, basically stopped um, semaglutide medication after 68 weeks and they looked at the weight regain and after, I think it was up to 120 weeks or so after a year after, um, they regained, I think it was 11% on average of, of their body weight. So the average weight loss after, after 120 weeks was just over 5%, which is still a significant amount of weight on average. On the, on the right, you can see these broken down into, you know, how much weight you lose. So the, if you lost the most amount of weight, you, you know, your weight regain was um, uh, still significant, but you still lost over 10% of your body weight after the year, after two years, sorry, which is still very significant. So the more weight you lose, yes, maybe the more you regain, but long-term, that's still a benefit to, to, to health. So anyway, so there is regain. But we should explain this because we don't want to say, oh, look, there's regain. That means no one should bother taking it because you come off and you just you just regain the weight. That's not true. So, like I said before, so after two years, weight loss was still around five to six percent on average. And that's not too dissimilar to second nature's outcomes after 12 months. This is still likely a net benefit to no weight loss. So there's still a benefit, even if regain does occur. Another uh, explanation. On the trial, it was effectively designed to see regain because they stopped the medication cold turkey. Imagine you just spent the last year or 14 months on a medication where your brain is 
24 hours a day being told to lower hunger, lower appetite, keep food intake in check. And then you just go cold turkey. It was obvious this was going to happen, particularly with the lifestyle interventions that are um, accompanying these trials. They're normally very ineffective. So yeah, they designed it in a way to promote regain. And typically pharma companies want to promote the drug as a lifelong requirement. They say, look, there's regain. You have to stay on it for life. It's not true. What if they were to do a titration down? They, this hasn't been studied yet. So we don't know the answer to this question. But what if at 68 weeks, they said, okay, now we're gonna go down to 1.7. And then in six weeks time, we're gonna go down to one and so on and so on. What would happen then? We don't know. My guess would be it might not see this dramatic regain, but we, yeah, we haven't got that data yet. So additionally, the lifestyle interventions using these studies were standard, ineffective um, lifestyle interventions, which second nature has been outperforming for the past seven years since we came into practice. They're not effective as shown by poor performance in placebo groups. So this placebo group might not have had semaglutide, but they still had support from dietitians, face-to-face -face group support and you know, information on, on diet. But we've known for the past 30 to 40 years that lifestyle interventions of that format are not effective as shown by the, the poor weight loss seen in this trial. They don't include adequate information on habit formation, how the brain learns, why the brain seeks out food in the way it does, the psychology of eating or behavioral science, all things that you know, we promote on the program, all things we believe are absolutely critical to maintaining weight loss, but also just living a healthy, purposeful life for the long term. And it's important to note that weight regain on Wegovi or semaglutide isn't a novel finding. It's a consistent and predictable response to lifestyle interventions, including second nature. There's always a J curve. So you always see a dramatic weight loss in the first 12 months, and then you see some weight regain on average. Some people maintain the weight loss, others don't. It's just the nature of obesity. It's really complicated. It's really hard to keep the weight off in the long term. So it's not a surprise that we saw that regain. So it's not a magic pill. It's not the wonder drug you might have heard. It's not the cure for obesity, but it is a tool that can provide an opportunity for individuals to address the underlying causes of their eating habits while not having to worry about hunger and an incessant desire to eat. One thing we're constantly told on Second Nature from our members is that previously, and even still now, they're always preoccupied by food. They can't get food out of their mind. They're constantly thinking, I need a snack, I need to eat. I'm worried about what I'm eating. What if I choose the wrong food? I feel guilty for choosing this. I feel gu guilty for eating that. I'm ashamed of myself, etc. They spend their entire lives where they cannot stop thinking about food. And interestingly, this drug directly interacts with the centers of the brain that control that incessant desire and are toning that down to give people some breathing space. Here's a bit of a comparison. So it's similar to antidepressants. So antidepressants aren't designed to cure depression and no psychologist will, um, will refer these, will prescribe these as a cure. They're prescribed to allow room to space and room for therapy so that therapy can actually work. So people can address the root causes of their condition, of their trauma, of their depression, their anxiety, their PTSD. So they can use therapy and eventually they come off the medication. That's the idea. That's how it should work. And there are good trials to show that does work for, for some people. So let's look at, let's discuss semaglutide and Wegovy in second nature. So you might be thinking, well, second nature is all about holistic weight loss. Second nature is all about behavioral science and habit formation. So why are we, um, you know, using GLP-1s and, and, and coming up with a new program? So let's stick with that comparison to depression. The medications allow room for treatment with a therapist or an MDT, a multidisciplinary team to treat the condition. And this is how we see it. If Wagovi is the antidepressant, providing people that room, then second nature is the therapy in this metaphor. Um, obviously, we're not actual therapy. So how does semaglutides, how does GLP-1s and Wagovi and those MPIC, how do they fit into second nature? 
or GLP ones for the right people, the right person, may allow people the time, space, and cognitive capacity to finally address the root causes of their obesity. So, I think it's important here. I don't actually have a slide on this, but it's something me and Tom will definitely be discussing at the end. It's that we're not using this webinar or this program to try and promote GLP ones for everyone. That is not our ambition at all. We actually are trying to design our website in a way which triages people away who are just looking for the cheapest drug. We don't want people who are just looking for Wigovi or semaglutides at the cheapest price because they want to lose weight for a wedding because they're, you know, maybe they have these, um, these, these thought biases around their weight and their body and they just feel like they need to be on this medication at all costs. We want to genuinely help people that understand that lifestyle interventions and the only way to maintain your weight loss in the long term is through actually addressing the root causes of your overconsumption, the things that lead to obesity, the environment, psychological trauma, habits, um, poor relationship with food developed through years of um, you know, your upbringing, the environment that, in which you were raised, and hundreds more. We want to be able to provide people that room to address the root causes of their obesity if they choose to be on a GLP-1 medication, if they feel it is the right tool for them. But it won't be the right tool for everyone. And I want to make that really clear because it's really important. This isn't a sales pitch. This is for the right people. This is the information you need to know. Okay. So for those of you maybe looking at Second Nature's new program, considering it in the future, or maybe you know someone who might benefit Maybe you're a doctor and you want to refer patients to us in the future. Um, the programme design is still being ironed, ironed out, but here's a quick overview of what you can expect. So we're roughly breaking down, sorry, the flies back on the screen. We're roughly breaking down the programme into three to four phases. And this will look different for everyone. But at the moment, this is kind of how we see it. The first phase we're calling adaptation because we, we know from clinical trials and from interviewing people who've been on it, GLP-1s, this is the most difficult part, adapting to life on the medication. You'll have a personal nutritionist or dietitian. It's a time to adapt to life and medication, learn how to manage those side effects if they are tolerable, uh, meet your group and be educated in nutrition and habit formation. Then moving on to growth, where you'll cement your new habits, gain a deeper understanding of your behavior, and the medication continues to support appetite control and you should start to see substantial weight loss. And then the transition phase. We want you to embrace your new healthy lifestyle, start to learn to self-regulate your behaviors and not relying solely on the medication. And, but the medication is still there to support your appetite. And then maintain maintenance beyond the 12 months. Hopefully the medication has worked to the point where you might feel you no longer need it. You've reached your weight loss goals or you're on the right trajectory. You're utilizing the skills you've gained over the past year. You continue to track and self-regulate your behavior and we're here if you need it and we do plan on working with our, um, our pharmaceutical partners and our prescribing partners on designing a titration program down from the medication for those people who need to come off at some stage and that will be our aim we want people to hopefully be able to come off the medication and maintain their weight loss in the long term because they've learned to self-regulate and things like that. Okay, right, that's enough of me talking. Right, so what we're going to do is we're gonna to go to a Q&A, but before then, Tom is just going to briefly maybe spend, I don't know how long you plan, Tom, maybe five minutes or so? Something yeah, not, like that. Not long, not long. We'll see how we get on, but yeah. Uh, he's just gonna briefly explain his experience with GLP-1, why he decided to go on it, and yeah, just his overall experience so far. Fire away, Tom. Cool. Thank you. And thank you for the questions so far that you've been um, uh, ad adding to the Q&A section. Please do, please do keep asking questions. Some of the ones that we haven't answered yet, we'll answer at the end um, because we'll try and group them together, talk about some studies, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, I have been on um, a Zempic, so a semaglutide, um, for the last two months um, and I decided to go on it um, because I am heavier than I would like to be 
Um, I wanted to get first-hand experience so that when we do launch this product, um, someone has gone through it and can provide the best support possible. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand the side effects as well. It's all well and good talking about research and reported stuff, but sometimes there are some side effects or other um, uh, other situations you might experience that aren't reported. Um, so uh, technically, I'm a little bit of a guinea pig, um, but actually it has been incredibly um, enlightening. Um, so as I said, I've been on it for the last two months. Um, I have lost uh, close to four kg, so about eight pounds. Um, and so when we consider a sustainable weight loss rate, which is about zero, uh, half to a whole kilogram or one to two pounds a week, I am within that kind of sustainable weight loss range so far. Now, if I had been losing weight too quickly or um, if I had had any issues, the prescribing partner that I'm working with would have changed my dosage. So it's important that um, if you were to sign up to this medication, that the prescribing partner has your safety and um, wants to look out for your health as best as possible. So, so far, I've been on the two lowest doses of Azempic. Um, which is 0 0.25 and 0 0.5 milligrams. The pen looks like this. Um, it would have a needle on here and you stick it in and you click it and you inject. Um, the three recommended um, sites, I have tried them all, um, are your tricep or your upper arm, your upper thigh and your stomach. I personally have preferred uh, the thigh and the stomach. That's just been more comfortable for me. Um, but one thing I will um, highlight, because I think it's something that someone has mentioned in one of the questions, is that actually I was quite anxious to initially inject. My main thought, and I'll be really honest with everyone, is that actually there was no going back. Like I'll, I'll have these side effects for a week and I have to deal with them. But actually having the support from my, from my wonderful wife um, was really helpful because actually it um, just made it a lot easier. And ever since then, the injecting, the self-administering uh, of it has been really easy. Um, so from that's the kind of background of it all, uh, why don't I talk about some symptoms now? So I will be very honest. I think I'm very lucky. Um, I think I've had very minor symptoms compared to some of the ones reported and to some of the people we have spoken to um, whilst doing our research for the product. Um, I've only had a few days, uh, I've actually, technically I've had two days where I was a little nauseous. Um, I've had a couple of situations where I've had a bit of heartburn, but controllable um i've had the the main one has probably been stomach ache because of that that slowing of the gastric emptying and probably eating too much and not being aware of it i've had a couple of headaches um but i don't know if they are just linked to my day-to-day -day life and working on a computer all day long um and I'm, i'll apologize in advance but um i think it's important to know that obviously when we have slowing of this gastric emptying that potentially our bowel movements might change but um mine luckily have been fairly regular again i apologize if that's too much but um it's important to kind of understand that the reported side effects aren't always as bad as as they could be um the one thing that i have found probably the most to have been affecting me is that i'm sweating a lot more so naturally our um uh, our temperature goes up slightly more and um there is a bit more fatigue as well. Um, so I am feeling quite tired compared to what I normally would do. I also have an 18, uh, 18 month old kid. So that could also be a benefiting factor. But yeah, there is uh, some unreported um, uh, side effects of fatigue. So um, it's important to be aware of those and, um, and just try and manage the symptoms. Now, um, because I am sweating a lot more, um, I am drinking a lot more water. Um, but I've been able to manage that quite quite easily and actually like toilet trips been very regular so that kind of side of things is is my body is just wanting to kind of stay hydrated and um, the biggest change for me has been that I'm probably eating around uh, 70 to 75 percent of what I would have normally ate before so um, probably just slightly smaller servings than what I would usually have still trying to have a balanced meal and I've definitely been snacking a bit less too but the thing that has been the most important factor here is um taking the medication or not taking the medication is all about um exploring your awareness of being full being hungry and knowing when to stop to avoid any kind of side effects 
um, that could result because of that. So I often found that I had more stomach ache if I hadn't stopped when I kind of thought I should have stopped. And so therefore I was an over four and then had that stomach ache. Um, I obviously mentioned the tiredness before. And um, I think the big thing about trying to manage your energy levels is about listening to your body. And I've definitely had to do that a lot more over the last two months, um, like going for a nap when needed to. Uh, it's OK. That's fine. Um, but also then trying to kind of maintain good lifestyle routines, such as going for a walk, getting some fresh air, um, trying to stay hydrated, making sure you're making the best food choices um, rather than picking on those more sugary carb based foods that give you instant energy but also kind of <laughs> might also impact your tiredness later on in the day um, and also to help with these kind of symptoms I have been trying to vary my foods my textures my flavors my colors to try and kind of enjoy food as much as possible listen to my hunger levels um, definitely trying to avoid over consuming foods um, and therefore trying to minimize my side effects and symptoms as best as possible so um, obviously, uh, I'm a registered nutritionist. Uh, I know this stuff, but that's where actually this lifestyle change and the support is so, so helpful. Um, now, one thing I will mention, and it's um, it's a very common noticed um, side effect, but it's very minor and very short term. I will have to like just state that um, is that I have had a little bit of a drop in my enjoyment of doing things and of food um, It's very common because of the way the medication is affecting um, our dopamine levels. Um, but actually, um, it, as I said, it's very short term and um, I've, bounced, I've bounced back really quickly. So it's something I would like to mention, but it's very controllable. And as I said, you do kind of get that um, increase again. Um, so the thing for me is that um as long as I am ensuring I'm OK, I'm safe, I'm healthy, um, I can acknowledge and and manage my symptoms as best as possible. And um, that has been the way that has helped me um, tolerate the medication and my symptoms as best as possible. So for me, it's been a, a good experience. It's been, as I said, very enlightening, um, knowing how I could feel, the changes that my body has been making and then ensuring that I maintain the best lifestyle changes and habits that I currently follow. Um, so that's kind of my experience so far. And um, I've seen there's a few um, questions about it and I'm happy to answer them. Um, but Robbie, should we open up the floor? To um, yes, well, I think there's a few, there's some amazing questions around insulin resistance and uh, in, impacts on the gut. I think we'll get to those in a second, but yeah, just as we're on your experience, Tom, one, thanks so much for sharing it. Um, but also, I think there's a couple of questions around your exercise regimen, and I think that is a really good question because it ties yeah. to the energy levels and things like that. And obviously, talk about uh, loss of lean mass. We had an amazing question in the Q and A about loss of muscle mass and lean mass during weight loss with Wegovy or semaglutide, and it can be significant. Uh, varies between 10 to 30 percent in some trials, um, but there are lifestyle factors that we can do to prevent that protein intake and exercise being the two main ones. And obviously if semaglutide prevents you from exercising, that might have an impact on lean mass. So how's it uh, impacted your, cause you're very active Tom, you play hockey. Yeah. You play gym. Um, so yeah, how's it impacted you? Yeah, so, um, so technically it's my off season right now. So I naturally do less at this time of year anyway. Um, I still try and maintain my fitness and my skill and, and that sort of stuff. Um, I would say again, listening to my body, I've had to do a little less. Um, but not a significant amount less. I think it's being aware of that kind of energy levels and that fatigue and actually being like, you know what, sometimes I might just have to go for a, a shorter walk or if I if I went for a run, not running as far or staggering how I run, whether it's like a walk and then a run and then a walk and then a run kind of pattern. Um, um, trying to keep um, my muscle mass up where possible by using resistance training, keeping up that protein level. But um I think if you if you have a good routine and you form a good exercise routine and you try and maintain that as best as possible, listening to your body, whether that is just having a few slightly lighter sessions. And if you do feel better one day, then you can have that slightly more normal or slightly higher um, routine um, or session. Then that that's all that's also OK. So I think it's really important that um, any uh, we talk about this on the program quite a lot that actually like any exercise is more beneficial than none. I think that's very similar in this approach 
as well. And that's, that's what I found as well. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. All really good advice and reflections. Um, cool. We've had, okay, I'm going to, there's a couple of questions around um, antidepressant medications and mood stabilizers. All I would say is I'm not aware of contraindications with those. You would imagine with any medication, um, if you're going to be on a new medication, your doctor will always have to do an, an assessment with you to determine the, pro the risks and rewards of being on two medications at once. So my advice for anyone who's considering a GLP-1 medication in line with existing medications, please speak with your doctor. That's one thing we probably should have caveated during this talk. Uh, me and Tom aren't medical doctors and we can't be given medical advice. So any questions around medications specifically like that, um, you know, we can't give you any indications as to what you should do. Our, our response would always be speak with your doctor. It's always the best way. They'll be well trained um, in this. It's, you know, the NHS is, is putting a lot of work into these programs for the future. Um, so yeah, speak with your doctor. Um, a local pharmacist would be able to help you there as well. Okay. Yeah, and, and just on that, like, so I went for, um, I have exercise induced asthma um, and I went for a, a review recently and I had a really, really helpful um, and comforting conversation with my practitioner. Um, so they, they are they are looking at the research and they are there to support you. So if you do have questions from a medical scope of practice, definitely speak to your pharmacist, your nurse or your GP. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Nice one. OK, so we had a couple of questions around insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. So, um, yes, essentially, the questions are, you know, what's the impact on types of diabetes and insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity? Uh, the answer is very positive. So the way that GLP-1s work is primarily the long-term benefits on type 2 diabetes are the weight loss. So the fact you're losing fat from your liver, your pancreas, that improves blood sugar um, immeasurably. You're losing fat from your, your fat cells, that improves your insulin sensitivity, your insulin resistance. You're reducing the levels of fat in your muscle as well, that improves your insulin sensitivity there and naturally weight loss and just reducing your energy intake leads to improvements in insulin sensitivity in the long term so yes um, but also it's not just the fact that you're losing fat that's stored around the body which is leading to insulin resistance um, it's also the impact on the pancreas itself so it's actually supporting the beta cells release an appropriate amount of insulin and heat and help rebalance the hormonal um, uh, the hormonal balance of your body effectively whilst you're on them and then for people when they manage to come off um yeah the the the, the improvements are still there so um yeah definitely a positive insulin resistance for sure okay um more questions around contra in indications and gut conditions to taking glp1s which is a brilliant all brilliant questions i'm not too sure i think i'll have to say i actually don't know um, you would imagine, like with anything, uh, other medical conditions, other medications are always a contraindication to anything because it could it could be an issue. So, again, I think my response would be, Tom, not sure if you have any thoughts, but probably best to speak with um, with. Yeah. Like you said, pharmacist, like you said, Tom, your prescribing partner. Uh, it sounds like they will be really, really helpful there. Yeah, I agree. OK, so. Um, a great question from Ruth, and um, you're right. Cold turkey is a very emotive phase, and I think I should, a phrase. I think I should have used a different term for that. You're absolutely right. Um, and so, how long do different studies suggest people should be on GLP-1? Now, the problem with this question is we don't really know. So, <laughs> all we know is that after about 68 weeks, because or a year, that seems to be the plateau in weight loss, I guess. It's it kind of, it's a very dramatic fall up to around six to nine months. And then the weight loss starts to slow down and it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't stop falling, but it slows down the rate of weight loss. So it seems after about a year, that's probably where you will see the biggest drop in weight. And after that, if you stay on, it might be more sustainable, slow rate of weight loss, depending where you're starting at as well um so yeah we don't really know and at the moment in the in in the uk it's recommended people only be on them for up to two years and that's mainly due to financing costs the nhs can't fund everyone to be on these forever but also 
like I said before, we don't want everyone to be on them forever, basically. Um, any thoughts there, Tom? Um, no, I totally agree with what you, you say. And I was going to talk about the um, National Institute of Clinical Excellence saying that kind of two year kind of time at the moment. But I think actually, if you are um, creating lifestyle change over time, that then actually like you are setting yourself up for um, sustainable um, control of your of your lifestyle over time. So therefore, you do not necessarily need to be on the medication for life. And so actually, it's a it's a use, as we said, a useful tool that then enables you to be able to make those sustainable changes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we've got some questions. It is past seven, so we'll have to wrap up pretty soon. We've got quite a few questions, um, specifically asking, you know, whether you your, your, you should be on the medication or um, people in your family should be on the medication. I think it's a very personal question. Um, this is something, a decision, a personal decision people will have to make. All I would say is that the best thing to do if you're unsure is, like we said already, speak with your doctor, speak with a pharmacist. Um, it might be a good intervention for you or someone you know, but it might not be the right thing. So, uh, yeah, me and Tom don't want to kind of convince you either way because it's, it's, it's really inappropriate to do so. This is a very personal decision, like with any medication. No one should ever just take a medication because they've been told to. They should take a medication because they understand the risks, the benefits of doing so, they understand the side effects, and they realize it's the personal decision for them. I hope I haven't just scared people off taking medication. <laughs> if your doctor's prescribing it, there's a reason for it, but it's important to discuss it and understand the risks and rewards of anything you take. Okay, All right, Tom, there are more questions, but I think we will have to call it a day um, because we are over time and, I don't know, you might not be hungry. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> so I think we have to call it there. But thanks so much for everyone uh, for coming. And sorry for any questions that we left unanswered. Um, please feel free to get in touch via email. Um, hello at secondnature.io. Feel free to speak with us on Second Nature, um, our, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can comment on any of our feeds and you know, let us know if you've got any questions. And yeah, I hope this is all very helpful. And um, Tom, any final words? No, thank you for um, all listening to us tonight. Um, and I hope that uh, this has been a, uh, uh, a time of education. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think your, um, your perspective, Tom, was really helpful. I think it kind of normalises and provides a bit of a human perspective as well, rather than just the numbers and stuff. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I hope so. I hope so. Excellent. All right. Cheers, Tom. And thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.